Chapter 36. As the evening wore on, Madame de Villefort manifested a desire to return to Paris, which Madame Danglars had not dared to do, despite her obvious agitation. At his wife's request, therefore, Monsieur de Villefort gave the first signal for departure. Just as Andrea Cavalcanti was about to climb into his tilbury, he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned around, thinking that Danglars or Monte Cristo had forgotten to tell him something, but instead of either one of them, he saw a strange, suntanned, bearded face with glittering eyes and an ironic smile which revealed 32 white, sharp teeth like those of a wolf or jackal. Whether because he recognized this face or because he was simply struck by its horrible appearance, Andrea started and shrank back. What do you want? he asked. I want you to save me the trouble of walking back to Paris. I'm very tired, and since I didn't dine with you as well as you did this evening, I can hardly stand up. I want you to let me climb into your handsome carriage here and drive me back to town. Andrea turned pale but said nothing. It's just a whim of mine, continued the man, putting his hands into his pockets and looking provocatively at Andrea. You can understand that, can't you, Benedetto? On hearing this name, Andrea walked over to his groom and said, this man has just come back from an errand. I sent him on, and I want him to tell me about it in private. Walk back to the outskirts of town and hire a cab for yourself there. <clears throat> the groom walked off in surprise. All right, get in, said Andrea to his ragged visitor. He drove past the last house of the village without saying another word, while his companion sat beside him smiling and also keeping silent. When they were outside of Atui, Andrea looked around to make sure no one could see or hear them. Then he stopped his horse, turned to his companion, and said, Why have you come here to bother me? And you, my boy, why do you mistrust me? What makes you think I mistrust you? Because when we left each other at the Pont de Val, you told me you were going to Piedmont in Tuscany, but instead you went to Paris. What's wrong with that? Nothing, nothing at all. In fact, I think it may even help me. Aha, said Andrea. So you intend to make money on me? You put it so crudely. That would be a mistake, Monsieur Caderousse. I'm warning you. Don't be angry with your old friend, my boy. You're liable to make me demanding. This threat made the young man's anger die down. The wind of constraint had just blown upon it. He started up his horse again. Is it my fault, he said, that I'm having good luck while you're still having bad luck? Your luck is really good, then. This isn't a rented tilbury and those aren't rented clothes. That's wonderful. I know you have a good heart. If you have two overcoats, I'm sure you will give me one of them. I used to give you my share of soup and beans when you were hungry. That's true, said Andrea. What an appetite you had, said Caderousse. It's still as good as it used to be. It certainly is, said Andrea, laughing. But a good dinner you must have had with that prince whose house you just left. He's only a count, not a prince. A count? He's rich, isn't he? Yes, but don't count on anything from him. I don't think you'll find him as easy a man to deal with. Oh, don't worry. I have no designs on your count, and I'll leave him off for you, but added Caderousse with an unpleasant smile. That will cost you something, you know. All right. How much do you need? I think I could live on 100 francs a month, but... But what? But I wouldn't be living very well. With 150 francs a month, I'd be very happy. Here's 200, said Andrea, handing Caderousse 10 gold louis. Good, said Caderousse. Come to see me on the first of every month, and as long as I get my allowance, you'll get yours. I see I wasn't mistaken, said Caderousse. You're a fine young boy, and it's a blessing when good fortune comes to people like you. Now tell me about your good luck. Do you need to know? Why do you need to know that? You still mistrust me, don't you? Uh, no, I found my father. Your real father. What do I care as long as he pays? What's your father's name? Major Cavalcanti. And he's satisfied with you. He seems to be satisfied so far. Who brought you to this father? The Count of Monte Cristo. The man you had dinner with tonight. Yes, listen. Why don't you try to get him to have me as a grandfather since he seems to be in the market for relatives? I'll go talk to him about you in the meantime. What are you going to do? It's very kind of you to ask about that, replied Caderousse. Since you are taking such an interest in me, said Andrea, and it seems to me I have a right to ask for a little information about you. Is that true? Well, I'm going to rent a room in an honest house, put on some decent clothes, have myself shaved every day, and go read newspapers in some cafe. At night, I'll go to the theater. Uh, I'll seem like a retired banker, which is my dream. 
Good. If you carry out that plan and behave yourself, everything will go very well. And now that you have what you want, hop out of my Tilbury and disappear. Oh, no, my friend. Why not? Because I'm dressed in rags. I have no papers at all. And I have 200 francs in gold in my pocket. I shall be arrested as a barrier. In order to justify myself, I'd be forced to say it was you who gave me the money. And that would lead to an investigation. And they find out I left the prison of Toulon without asking permission. Then they take me back there. And that would be the end of my dream of living like a retired banker. No, my boy. I would prefer to remain honorably in Paris. Andrea frowned and stopped his horse. As he glanced searchingly around him, his hand moved innocently into his pocket where it touched the trigger guard of a small pistol. In the meantime, Caderousse, who had not taken his eyes off his companion, had put his hands behind his back and gently opened a long Spanish knife, which he always carried in case of emergency. The two friends were clearly well suited to understand each other, which they did. Andrea's hand slipped harmlessly from his pocket and rose to his red mustache, which he caressed silently for some time. All right, he said finally. We'll go to Paris together. But how will you get past the barrier without arousing suspicion? It seems to me that those clothes you'll be running a greater risk in a Tilbury than you would on foot. Oh, wait, said Caderousse. You'll see. He took Andrea's hat and put it on, along with an overcoat which the groom had left behind. Not me, asked Andrea. What am I going to be? Am I going to be bareheaded? It's windy tonight. The wind could have easily blown off your head. Let's get it over with then, said Andrea. They passed the barrier without incident. Andrea stopped his horse at the first side street, and Caterice leaped out of the Tilbury. What about my hat and my servant's overcoat? said Andrea. You wouldn't want me to risk catching a cold, would you? replied Caterice. Goodbye, Benedetto. And he vanished down a side street. Andrea sighed and said to himself, I suppose it's impossible to be perfectly happy in this world. Chapter 37 on his way back from Monte Cristo's house in Autuy, Debray arrived at the door of the Danglars' residence just as Madame Danglars was returning home. With the air of a man familiar with the house, he entered the courtyard first, threw the reins of his horse to a footman, and offered his arm to Madame Danglars to accompany her to her apartment. At the door of the bedroom, they met Mademoiselle Cornelie, her confidential maid. "'What is my daughter doing?' asked Madame Danglars. "'She studied all evening and then went to bed,' replied Mademoiselle Cornelie. "'But it seems to me I hear her piano now.' That's Mademoiselle de Armely. She plays for Mademoiselle Eugenie while she's in bed. I see, said Madame Danglars. Come in and dress me. They entered the bedroom. Debray stretched out on a large sofa while Madame Danglars passed into her dressing room with Mademoiselle Cornelie. Monsieur Lucien, said Madame Danglars to Debray through the do door of her dressing room, haven't you always complained that Eugenie never speaks to you? I'm not the only one to make such a complaint, replied Debray, playing with Madame Danglars' small dog, which, recognizing his status as a friend of the family, was extremely friendly to him. That's true, said Madame Danglars, but I think that will change one of these mornings and that you'll see Eugenie walk into your office. Why? To ask for an engagement at the opera. I've never seen such an obsession with music. It's ridiculous for a fashionable young lady like her. Debray smiled and said, let her come with her parents' consent, and we'll give her an engagement, although we're rather poor to pay for such an extraordinary talent like hers. You may go now, Cornelie, said Madame Danglars. I don't need you any longer. Cornelie went out. A moment later, Madame Danglars came out of her dressing room in a, car in a charming negligee and sat down beside Debray. She then began to caress her little dog absentmindedly. Debray looked at her for a few moments in silence. Answer me frankly, Hermione, he said. Something's bothering you, isn't it? No, nothing's bothering me. Madame Danglars stood up, breathed deeply, and looked at herself in a mirror. I look terrible tonight, she said. Debray was about to stand up also and reassure her on this point when suddenly the door opened and Baron Danglars appeared. Madame Danglars turned around and looked at her husband with an astonishment which she took no pains to conceal. Good evening, madam, said the banker. Good evening, Monsieur Debray. Madame Danglars assumed that this unexpected visit signified something like a desire to make amends for the bitter words which had escaped from him during the day. Arming herself with a dignified air, she turned to Debray without answering her husband and said, Please read me something, Monsieur Debray. Debray, who had been made slightly uneasy by this visit at first, regained his composure when he saw Madame Danglars calm. He reached out his hand for a book. Excuse me, madam, said Danglars, but you'll tire yourself by staying up so late and Monsieur Debray lives far from here. Debray was thunderstruck, not because of the Baron's tone, which was perfectly calm and polite, but because 
Beneath this calm and politeness, he detected a certain unwanted determination of the Baron's part to do something other than follow his wife's wishes. Madame Danglars was also surprised and manifested her astonishment by a look which would no doubt have given her husband pause if his eyes had not been fixed on the financial page of a newspaper. Her haughty glance was therefore completely wasted. Monsieur Dubray, said Madame Danglars, I assure you I'm not at all sleepy and that I have hundreds of things to tell you this evening. You shall stay and listen to them even if you go to sleep on your feet. At your service, madam, replied Debray phlegmatically. My dear Monsieur Debray, said Danglars, please don't force yourself to stay up and listen to my wife's foolishness tonight. You can listen to it just as well tomorrow. Tonight, I'm going to reserve her company for myself because I have some very important things to discuss with her. This time, the blow was so direct that both Debray and Madame Danglars were stunned. They looked at each other as though each hoped to draw help from the other in the face of this aggression. But the irresistible power of the master of the house prevailed, and the husband was victorious. Don't think I'm turning you out of my house, Monsieur Debray, continued Danglars. It's just that certain unexpected circumstances make me wish, wish to have a conversation with my wife this evening. It happens so seldom that I'm sure you won't hold it against me. Debray stammered a few words, bowed, and left. It's unbelievable, he said to himself, how these husbands, who seem so ridiculous to us, still manage to gain the upper hand over us so easily. When Debray had gone, Danglars took his place on the sofa, closed the book, which had remained open, and striking a terribly pretentious pose, began to play with the dog. But the dog did not have the same affection for him as for Debray, and tried to bite him. Danglars picked it up by the skin of its neck and threw it across the room into a chair. The animal uttered a cry as it flew through space, but arrived at its destination. It crouched silently and motionlessly behind a cushion, overcome with surprise at such an unaccustomed treatment. You're making progress, said Madame Danglars. Usually you're only crude. Tonight you're brutal. That's because I'm in a worse humor than usual. Madame Danglars looked at her husband with utter disdain. Ordinarily, these scornful glances exasperated the proud Danglars, but this time he seemed to pay no attention. What do I care about your bad humor? asked Madame Danglars, irritated by her husband's impassiveness. Keep it in your own bedroom or in your office, and since you have clerks who work for you, take it out on them. That's bad advice, and I won't follow it replied Danglars. My clerks are honest men who make my fortune for me and whom I pay much less than they deserve if I reckon their worth according to what they bring in. No, I won't take out my anger on them. I'll take it out on those who eat my dinners, wear out my horses, and ruin my fortune. And who are these people that ruin your fortune? Explain yourself more clearly. You understand me very well, but if you persist in denying it, let me inform you that I just lost 700,000 francs on the Spanish bonds. Is it my fault? You lost 700,000 francs. In any case, it wasn't mine. Once and for all, said Madame Danglars sharply, let me tell you not to talk money with me. It's a language I learned neither from my parents nor in the house of my first husband. I'm sure you didn't. None of them had a sou. Nevertheless, I thought you took a keen interest in my financial operations. Whatever made you believe such a ridiculous thing? Oh, it's not hard to explain, said Danglars. For example, last February, you spoke to me about the Haitian bonds. You had dreamed that a ship sailed into the Havre with the news that a payment, which everyone considered to have been postponed indefinitely, was about to be made in full. I know the lucidity of your dreams, so I secretly bought up all the Haitian bonds I could find, and I made 400,000 francs on them, of which you received 100,000. What you did with that money is not my concern. In March, a railroad franchise was about to be granted. Three companies presented themselves as candidates for it, all three of them offering equal guarantees. You told me your instinct led you to believe that the franchise would be given to the company known as the Society de Midi. And although you claim to have no interest in business, I believe your instinct to be highly developed in certain matters. I therefore bought two-thirds of the shares of that company. The franchise was granted to it as you predicted. Its shares tripled in value and I made a million francs, of which I gave you 250000 as pin money. How did you spend it? Come to the point, cried Madame Danglars, trembling with anger and impatience. Be patient. I'm almost finished. In April, you had dinner at the minister's house, where you overheard a secret conversation about the expulsion of Don Carlos. I bought up Spanish bonds. The expulsion took place and I made 600,000 francs. You received 150,000 francs, which you disposed of according to your fancy. I don't ask you to account for your money to me. But the fact remains that you received half a million francs this year. But now things begin to go less 
smoothly. Three days ago, you were discussing politics with Monsieur de Bray, and you gathered from what he said that Don Carlos had returned to Spain. I began to sell my bonds. The news spread. There was a panic, and soon I wasn't selling my bonds, but I was giving them away. The next day, it turned out the news was false, and it had caused me a loss of 700,000 francs. Well, since I give you a quarter of my winnings, you owe me a quarter of my losses. A quarter of 700,000 francs is 175,000. You're talking nonsense, and I don't see what Monsieur Debray has to do with any of this. If by any chance you don't have the 175,000 francs I'm demanding, you'll have to borrow it from your friends, and Monsieur Debray is one of your friends. This is an outrage, cried Madame Danglars. Let's not have any histrionics, or you'll force me to say that I can see Monsieur Debray gloating over the half million francs you counted out to him this year and telling himself that at last he's found something the most skillful gamblers have never been able to discover. A game in which you win without putting up any money and lose nothing when you lose. Do you dare to tell me you knew nothing about these things till now? Cried Madame Danglars furiously. I won't say I knew, and I won't say I didn't. I'll say only this. Observe my conduct in the four years since we stopped being husband and wife, and you'll see that it's always been consistent. Some time after our rupture, you decided to study music with that famous baritone who made such a successful debut at the Theatre Italian. As for myself, I decided to study dancing with that dancer who made such a reputation for herself in London. It cost me a hundred thousand francs for both of us. But I said nothing because harmony is necessary in a household and a hundred thousand francs isn't too much to pay so that a husband and wife can learn dancing and singing thoroughly. Soon, you grew tired of singing and decided to take lessons in diplomacy from a secretary of the minister. I let you study. What did it matter to me as long as you paid for your lessons out of your own funds? But now I see that you've begun to dip into mine and that your apprenticeship may cost me 700,000 francs a month. It's time to call a halt. Either the diplomat gives free lessons or I'll go and I'll go on tolerating him or else he'll never set foot in this house again. Do you understand me? This is too much, cried Madame Danglars, choking with anger. You've gone all, you've gone beyond all limits of common decency. Danglars shrugged his shoulders. What silly creatures they are, he said. These women who consider themselves geniuses because they carry on their love affairs without getting themselves talked about all over Paris. But even you, if you did, you'd manage to hide your peccadilloes from your husband, which is the ABC of the art, since most of the time the husband doesn't want to see anything, you'd still be only a pale imitation of half your friends. Not one of your actions has escaped me for the past 16 years while you were applauding your own skill and remaining firmly convinced that you were deceiving me. The result of my pretended ignorance is that there hasn't been one of your lovers. From, from Monsieur de Villefort down to Monsieur de Bray, who hasn't trembled before me. I allow you to make me hateful, but I will prevent you from making me ridiculous. And above all, I forbid you to ruin my fortune. Up to the moment when her husband pronounced the name of Monsieur de Villefort, Madame Danglars had retained a large measure of self-assurance, but on hearing that name, she turned pale, leaped to her feet, and stepped toward her husband as though to tear from him the rest of the secret which perhaps he did not know, but which he might know and not wish to reveal. Monsieur de Villefort, she cried, what do you mean by that? I mean that your first husband, seeing perhaps that there was no advantage to be gained from a public prosecutor, died of grief and anger when he returned from an absence of nine months to find you'd been pregnant for six months. Why did he die instead of killing? Because, because he had no fortune to save. But I do have a fortune to think of. Monsieur de Bray, my partner, has made me lose 700,000 francs. Let him bear his share of the loss and we'll go on as before. Otherwise, let him go bankrupt for the 175,000 francs and do what all bankrupts do, disappear. I won't deny he's a charming young man when his information is correct, but when it isn't, there are at least 50 others in the world who are worth more than he is. Madame Danglars was overwhelmed. She sank into a chair, thinking of Villefort, the scene at Monte Cristo's house, and the strange series of disasters which had befallen her one after the other in the past few days. Danglars did not even look at her, although she was doing her best to faint. He walked out of the room without saying another word, so that Madame Danglars, as she came out of her state of semi consciousness, was able to convince herself, with some success, that she had only had a bad dream. Chapter 38. The next day, at the hour when Debray usually stopped by to pay a short visit to Madame Danglars on his way to the office, his carriage did not appear in the courtyard. 
Soon afterward, Madame Danglars ordered her own carriage and left. Danglars, hidden behind a window curtain, watched her departure, which he had been expecting. He gave orders to be notified as soon as she came back, but at two o'clock, she still had not returned. At two o'clock, the baron went to the chamber. When he came out, he instructed his coachman to drive him to the 30 Avenue de Champs-Élysées, where he found the Count of Monte Cristo at home. "'What's the matter, baron?' asked Monte Cristo when he saw him. "'You look disturbed, and that frightens me. A worried capitalist is like a comet. He always presages some disaster for the world.' I've been pursued by bad luck for several days, said Danglars. I hear nothing but bad news. My latest information was a bankruptcy in tryst. Are you speaking of Jacopo Manfredi by chance? Precisely. Just think of it. A man with whom I'd been dealing for with, with for I don't know how long. And never a mistake, never a delay. A man who paid like a prince. I advance him a million francs and all of a sudden, Jacopo Manfredi suspends his payments. Along with the Spanish affair, that makes it fine end of the month for me. Was it really a loss for you, the Spanish fair? It certainly was. It cost me 700,000 francs. But as long as we're talking about business, added Danglars, delighted to find a way of changing the subject, suppose you tell me what I'm to do for Monsieur Cavalcanti. Why, well, give him money, if his credit seems good to you. It seems excellent to me. He came to me this morning and I gave him 40,000 francs. He also opened a credit for 5,000 francs a month for his son. 60,000 francs a year, said Monte Cristo. What does he expect a young man to do with 5,000 francs a month? Of course, if the young man should need a few thousand francs extra, don't advance it to him. His father wouldn't make it good. You don't know these Italian millionaires. They're real misers. Do you mean to say you don't trust this Cavalcanti? Of course I trust him, said Monte Cristo. I'd gladly give him 10 million francs on his signature alone. His fortune is beyond doubt. All these wealthy Italians usually marry among themselves, don't they? Asked Danglars nonchalantly. I suppose they like to combine their fortunes. That's true, they usually do, but Cavalcanti is an eccentric young man who never does anything like other people. I'm convinced he's brought his son to France so that he'll find a wife here. Do you really think so? I'm sure of it. Do you know anything about his fortune? I hardly know him. All I know about him is that is what he's told me himself and what the Abbe Busoni has told me. Just this morning, the Abbe Busoni was telling me that Cavalcanti was tired of seeing his fortune lie dormant in Italy, which is a dead country, and that he wanted to find some way of investing it in either France or England. When his son marries, he'll probably give him two or three, thousand, three million francs. If he marries a banker's daughter, for example, his father may invest in the firm of his son's father-in-law. Yes, but he'll no doubt find some princess to marry, won't he? Not necessarily. These great Italian lords frequently marry ordinary mortals. But why are you asking me these questions? Do you have someone in mind for Andrea to marry? To tell you the truth, said Danglars, it doesn't seem like a bad speculation to me, and I'm a speculator. You're not thinking of your daughter, are you? Isn't she already engaged to Albert de Morcerf? Monsieur de Morcerf and I have discussed the marriage on several occasions, it's true, but Madame de Morcerf and Albert... Do you mean to say it's not a good match? Albert may not be as rich as your daughter, but you can't deny that he bears an honorable name. No doubt. But I prefer my own name, said Danglars. I wasn't born a baron, but at least Danglars is my real name. Do you mean to say that the Count of Morcerf's real name isn't Morcerf? It certainly isn't. I was made a baron, so I really am a baron, but he made himself a count, so he isn't really a count. Impossible. Listen, Count, continued Danglars. I've known Monsieur de Morcerf for 30 years. As you know, I make no secret of my origins. Well, when I was a humble clerk, Morcerf was a humble fisherman. What was he called then? Fernand Mondego. Are you sure? He sold me enough fish for me to know him. Then why are you marrying your daughter to his son? Because Fernand and Danglars are both of a humble birth. They both acquired a title and they both became rich. One is therefore essentially as good as the other, except for certain things that have been said about him, which have never been said about me. What do you mean? Nothing. Just a minute. I understand. What you just said has refreshed my memory. I heard the name of Fernand Mondego mentioned in Greece. In connection with the Ali Pasha affair? Precisely. That's the big mystery, said Danglars. And I'll admit, I'd given a, I have given a lot to find out about it. That wouldn't have been difficult to do if you really wanted to. You have correspondence in Greece, haven't you? Of course. And Yanina? I have correspondence everywhere. 
All right, then write to your correspondent in Yanina and ask him what part a Frenchman named Fernand Mondego played in the Ali Pasha affair. You're right, exclaimed Danglars, standing up. I'll write to him today. And if you should learn some scandalous piece of news, I'll tell you about it. Danglars hurried out of the Count's house and into his carriage.